My name is David Daniel Ball and this is an article on bias within the ABC. All the information is taken from missives that I have read to do with Andrew Bolt's articles for Saturday the 28th of March 2009. How much influence does China have on Rudd's team? Did the Chinese government ultimately pay for Defence Minister Joel Fitzgibbon's free and undisclosed travel? The Chinese businessman who paid for trips to China by the Defence Minister Joel Fitzgibbon accompanied him on the visits and introduced him to the political officials. Mr. Fitzgibbon yesterday confirmed that Helen Liu had played a central role during two China trips after he was forced to apologize for failing to declare that he had been paid for by the businesswoman. Her role in introducing Mr. Fitzgibbon to Chinese political officials, as well as for paying for his trips, indicates she is well connected to the Chinese government. Indeed, did the Chinese government also ultimately pay for Prime Minister Kevin Rudd's many free trips? To summarize, a Chinese government-owned company shares the address, phone number, and line of business of a company, which in turn runs the website of the mysterious company which sponsored Kevin Rudd's trips. Meanwhile, more covert lobbying by China. The propaganda chief of the Chinese Communist Party visited the country farm of ABC chairman Maurice Newman during his mysterious visit to Australia. The next day, Li Chang-un lobbied ABC managing director Mark Scott over the broadcaster's coverage of Tibet, saying he wanted the Chinese government's views fully represented. However, Kevin Rudd's office yesterday moved to shut down any further disclosures about the movements of China's fifth most powerful man during his Australian visit this week. Mr. Rudd's office last night refused the weekend Australian's request that it release the full itinerary of Mr. Lee's five-day taxpayer-funded official visit, which ended on Tuesday. Rudd is now spinning frantically in reverse to avoid the Manchurian candidate tag. Chinese-owned Min Metals has been blocked from acquiring the key asset in its $2.6 billion bid for Oz Minerals because the South Australian gold and copper mine was too close to a sensitive Australian defence facility. But Dennis Shanahan urges caution. But ill-timed bumbling doesn't mean Labour is handing over Australian sovereignty to China, nor that Rudd is the Manchurian candidate with a Chinese chip in his neck, and Harold Holt in the backyard of the lodge. As China undoubtedly becomes more aggressively economically and militarily in a world it is increasingly going to influence, there are legitimate concerns about putting Australia's security, national resource or economic at Beijing's beck and call. The Prime Minister and Wayne Swan both know they face a diabolical dilemma in choosing to accept the much-needed Chinese investment while trying to keep China from controlling resource production in Australia and hence prices for our exports through state-owned companies or investment funds. But I'm concerned that to the Chinese, silence from potential partners on some issues is golden. And I'm also concerned that Rudd is personally very ambitious to be such a partner for political and post-politics positioning as much as for any interest of the national interest. In an update, opposition Treasury spokesman Joe Hockey attacks. I'm concerned about, you know, the patterns of behavior at the moment. Kevin Rudd received free trips when he was in the opposition from Chinese interests. Wayne Swan, the treasurer, received these trips. Tony Burke, the agriculture minister. Now we hear about the defense minister receiving free trips from China. At the same time, we learned today that the Australian government is borrowing around $500 million a week from Chinese government. And, you know, then we discovered that Kevin Rudd had a meeting with the Chinese propaganda minister and didn't tell the Australian media. I mean, what is going on? Reporter Lenore Taylor's verdict? Dog whistling to the xenophobics among us. Late Line's reporting was typically one-sided. Turnbull's picture was calm and assured as he called for the sacking of Fitzgibbon and gave valid, cogent reasons. The voiceover described it as desperate. Preceding that image was a nauseating, sweating, spinning Rudd, furtively licking his lips and looking for all the world out of his depth, saying he was disappointed but would do nothing. The voiceover assured us things were happening, but the infringement was minor. Then, in an interview with Alexander Downer, the interviewer interrupted him and demanded he address a false dichotomy suggesting Turnbull's leadership was in trouble. The masterful Downer calmly handled that lousy interviewer. The issue, as I see it, is that the ABC is so partisan that the threat of a failing government covering up international indiscretions goes unexamined. Louise Adelt. There seemed on Q&A last night a great eagerness, especially from Louise Adler, the Melbourne University Press publisher, to condemn Israel for war crimes in Gaza on the basis of allegations which seemed at least questionable, as I tried to point out. 
Louise Adler. I think they are devastating in testimonies, and I think it's quite interesting that those testimonies were delivered in the context of returning Gazan soldiers from Gaza to new recruits in a military college called Oranum in Israel. I think they're devastating reports, and they speak to the dehumanizing kind of atmosphere that I think we get from years of occupation. So they are symptoms, if you like, of people, 18 years old children, being sent to monitor man checkpoints going to Gaza, and those kids are then, how on earth is one to empathize? How on earth is one to feel a sense of humanity in relation to those people that you're meant to protect and control and repress from your society? Susan Carland. I agree. I think obviously these images, these words, the t-shirts are horrendous and very distressing, but honestly they're not surprising. I think we're seeing ugly things that are coming from both sides. It's a really ugly situation. The t-shirts and the comments are simply a manifestation of exactly what's going on over there. Andrew Bolt, Tony, as you know, there are so many allegations made against Israel and then treated as fact, like the Janine massacre. You remember that. You know the bombed ambulance. You remember that. And again and again, the bombed school in the last offensive. You remember that. And then we later find out the facts are slightly different. Let's wait for the facts. Now those facts are indeed starting to emerge, and it seems Adler was far, far too eager to believe the worst. Melanie Phillips unpicks the allegations at length and concludes, There are precisely two charges of gratuitous killing of Palestinian civilians under alleged explicit orders to do so. One is what even Haaretz made clear was an accidental killing when two women misunderstood the evacuation route the Israeli soldiers had given them and walked into a sniper's gun sight as a result. Moreover, the soldier who said this has subsequently admitted he didn't see this incident. He wasn't even in Gaza at the time, and had merely reported rumour and hearsay. The second charge is based on a supposedly real incident in which an elderly woman came close to an IDF unit. An officer ordered that they shoot her because she was approaching the line and might have been a suicide bomber. The soldier relating the story did not say whether or not the woman in this story actually was shot. Indeed, since he says from the description of what happened, it would appear this was merely hearsay once again. Regarding the incident in which it was claimed that a sniper fired at a Palestinian woman or two daughters, the brigade commander's investigation cites the sniper. I saw the woman and her daughters and I shot warning shots. The section commander came up to the roof and shouted at me, why did you shoot at them? I explained that I did not shoot at them but I fired warning shots. Officers from the brigade surmise that fighters that stayed in the bottom floor of the Palestinian house thought he had hit them. And from here the rumor that a sniper killed a mother and her two daughters spread. The other claim that a sniper killed an elderly woman may also be untrue. Regarding the second incident, in which it was claimed that soldiers went up to the roof to entertain themselves with firing and killed an elderly Palestinian woman, the brigade command investigation found that there was no such incident. Did Carland come clean on Q&A? On Q&A last night, I challenged Muslim convert and academic Susan Carland when she claimed Muslims were just being demonized as Italian and Greek immigrants had been before, and for just as little reason. It's just the Muslims' turn now, she claimed. No different. I said there was indeed something very different this time around with Muslim immigrants, a rejectionist strand, and I noted that she conceded herself in an interview in Malaysia Star newspaper that she'd come under a lot of pressure from the community to cut off non-Muslim friends and withdraw from society and all that was haram. This wasn't something she shared with the ABC audience. Caught off guard, Carland replied, there's a very small minority of people within the Muslim community that are reluctant to engage with a wider community. And when I pointed out that in her interview she'd actually spoken not of a very small minority but a majority, she denied having suggested any such thing. Maybe your translation from the Malay. The Star is in fact an English language newspaper and I'll let you judge now from its report who best summed up what Carland in fact said. Lifting the veil as her talk was aptly titled, what she had to say certainly made many cringe. Barely had the last words of the Shahada proclamation of faith left the lips of new converts, she said, that they find themselves bombarded with rules to adhere to. Never mind that the sister doesn't know how to pray, she is told she must get rid of all of her old clothing because it's too western and the un-Islamic can put on the hijab headscarf immediately. Don't worry that our new brother has only been a Muslim for three minutes. He's already been told that he has to throw out all his music and get rid of his dog or he'd be committing a big sin. The list of unreasonable pressures on converts, including telling converts to leave their so-called harem jobs immediately, even if the person had no other source of income. The newbies are asked to give up hobbies like painting and photography, dancing or playing instruments. They're advised to move out and sever ties with their kafir, infidel family and non-Muslim friends, while female converts are urged to get married as soon as possible. They are often expected to give up their own cultures and take on Arab subcontinental or Malay or other cultures because these are deemed to be more Islamic. Carland also takes the Muslim community to task for having an almost schizophrenic attitude towards converts. 
On the one hand, she pointed out Muslims like converts because they made them, the Muslims, feel good about themselves and their faith. But on the flip side, converts were often made to feel inferior by those born Muslims. On mosques, Carlin said that these institutions were not just supportive enough of new converts. Female converts report being shouted out, criticized, and were simply ignored by both.